the first speaker is Professor Victor Larin, uh, academician. He's in, uh, from uh, Vladivostok. He's, uh, as, you, mo as many of you know, is he's uh, director of the Institute of History, Archaeology, and Ethnology of the uh, of the peoples of the Far East, and he's one of the co-authors uh, of our uh, major co-authors of our report and the uh, scientific co-chairman of the whole of the, of the whole effort. So, I mean, uh, in in our effort from the beginning, we invite of course, people from the Far East and Siberia to be, to be part of it. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, it's an honor for me to be the first speaker among so many prominent scholars who take part in this conference. But, uh, you know, it's more a pleasure for me to be back. 20 years ago, I had a chance to stay for 10 months in Singapore as a, in, a group of, in a small group of Soviet uh, scholars who studied Chinese, and I studied Chinese history. And that time, there was a joke among uh, Singaporean students. They said that in mid-70s, uh, Singapore had two choices. The first choice was to wear Mao Zedong uniform, and the second was to have Kalashnikov guns. So, but it's a fortune that uh, Singapore chose uh, the other way, its own way, and now we gathered here to talk about Russian future, which looks uh, important to be important not only for Russia not, uh, now, but for all the world, and including Southeast Asia, including Singapore. It's uh, everybody understand. It looks that everybody understand now that time to develop the Russian Far East has come. But to my mind, very few people understand how to develop the Far East. We have a lot of ideas, but to my mind, there is no real understanding how to develop this vast and very complicated region. So I suppose that international cooperation is crucial to take right way in for this development. And uh, I have to excuse for this uh, provocative title of my presentation, because I suppose we have two choices now, two choices now uh, to, if you speak about Russian Far East. The first choice is to use the resources of the Far East and Siberia for the interests of all mankind. The other choice is to provocate the struggle among nations for these resources. So I prefer the first way. But uh, I would like to start with some image. Image of the Far East. What do you think of when, uh, when you hear the word Far East? First of all, first of all it's distance. It's distance. So it's Far East for Moscow, London, uh, other European capitals. It's far west for Tokyo, Washington. It's far north for Singapore, Beijing, and other countries. And uh, it's uh, we're happy that nobody says that it's far south. I suppose in the 21st century we have to eliminate this word far and change the approach to this region fundamentally. And we try to use another uh, name for this region, not the Far East, but Pacific Russia. The second, uh, but when, what we usually remember when we talk about Far East, it's climate. Everything is very cold there. The third, it's rich natural resources, first of all, oil and gas, fish, and wood. But, you know, people were never put in the center of government policy towards the Far East, neither economic nor humanitarian, but usually they use geopolitical goals which always dominated in Russia Pacific policy and uh, the attitude of Russian government to these territories. So I move to basic features of Russia and uh, USSR Pacific policy. 
And I suppose all these basic features are still alive. Sergei Karaganov mentioned Eurocentrism, and I suppose it's still alive in the, in the minds of political, business, and academic elites of Russia. I have to mention the cycl uh, cyclical nature of Russia-Pacific policy, which were activated with increasing international activity in the region. It was a reactive policy, and it is still a reactive policy. It is an attempt to answer the challenges which uh, come from this region. The third feature was inability of Russia to form real strategy in the Pacific. So uh, both issues are very close, Pacific policy and the development of the Far East. Another feature was the absolute primacy of the military strategic approaches over economic considerations. And I suppose that today, today's Russia turned to the East are driven by geopolitical but not economical interests. And the last one, uh, Russian Pacific territories were and still is a tool in Russia Pacific policy. So this, uh, this area's uh, economic, well, this area's development uh, was never and is not an economic project, but it is a strategic project, it's strategic operation. What role Russian Far East territories played in the Russian past. First of all, it was military outpost and base for further expansion to the east. The second one, cultural frontier and buffer zone between Europe and Asia, between east and west. The third one, Far East was resource base for European motherland. And the last one, it was a reserved territory for romantic pioneers, prisoners, and exiles. <coughs> so, these features uh, prescribe special model of Pacific Russia development before the 21st centuries. Role of military in regional administration. Strict control of the central government over the territory. Economics always was di directed to serve the military purposes, and migrants dominated in the structure of population in the Far East. What happens in the, at the age of 20th and 21st century? Well, some, something happened, uh, the same was as in Russia, but some special features I have to mention. The first was strong migra uh, migration tendencies and decrease in population. It's about 22, 23 percent by 2013. So now we have only 6.3 million people for 8.2 million square kilometers. So population density is three times less than in Australia. Another feature, it's a low level confidence to the central government, in spite of uh, many attempts of present day Russian administration, of Kremlin and the Russian government to persuade the people who live in the Far East that the central government in, is interested in the development of this region, people do not believe in these words. And the last one, it's changes in economic orientation and people's interest toward East Asian countries. So one of the main features, what, 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 one of the main things what happened for the last two decades with the Pacific Russia is the close approach to East Asia and to Asia Pacific region. We can see this approach in three spheres, economic sphere, political and bureaucratic sphere and humanitarian sphere. I, you can see all these and I will not read it. So I just uh, give you one example, example based on the public opinion poll. 
uh, taken not not long ago uh, this uh, autumn in south part of Pacific Russia. So when they ask people what are the priority directions to develop economic relations of the territories of the Far East, people choose East Asian countries first of all. Or Asian territories, you see, first is Siberia, Far East territories, then goes China, Japan, South Korea. And after that only goes European Russia. So people feel economically integrated in Asia and would like to strengthen and widen this integration. A couple of words about last stages of Russia-Pacific engagement. I distinguish three stages of this engagement. First one was in 90s. The next one in the beginning of new century when uh, central government tried to diversify, diversify the relations, Russian relations with East Asian countries to pay more attention not only to China but to Japan, South Korea, India, Southeast Asia. And the third stage was accepted since uh, December of 2006 when uh, Security Council of uh, Russian Federation made a decision that there is a threat for Russia to lose Far Eastern territories. So geopolitical goals were made a top priority and uh, the idea to make Pac uh, Russia a Pacific power and to protect the Far East as Russian territory was implemented, implemented for this year. So, and what is the role of Pacific Russia in this strategy? Russia, Pacific Russia should be a bridge and hub linking Asia, Eurasia and Europe. Some results, some results of this strategic operation of the last five years. Yes, yeah, there are some good results that uh, Asia Pacific countries share in Russian foreign trade increased. Uh, more uh, Russia Far East foreign trade also increased substantially. Oil and gas pipelines to the Pacific coast were constructed. A number of federal and state cooperation strategies and programs to develop the Far East and Baikal region appeared. And well, everybody knows about APEC summit in Vladivostok. Okay, yeah. Just to demonstrate the growth in the Far East trade, trade with Northeast Asian countries. Yeah, I'll give you a chance to take pictures. <laughs> okay, let's go on. So, can we say about next step taken this year? Sergei Karaganov also mentioned this words of Vladimir Putin that the rise of Siberia and the Far East is our national priority for the 21st century. Well, it's a good idea, but it's very hard to realize. And I distinguish three M to deal with three main problems for Russia, which <coughs> Russia has to solve. First one, money to develop Siberian Far East. It's a huge project which takes a huge money. And Russia, no one country in the world has enough money to do it individually. Second one, management. I, yesterday I suppose that it, it, it's, it's a problem that nobody in the Russian government studied in Likuan Yu's uh, School of Public Policy. So maybe it's a reason. And the third one, mentality. Mentality, strong European intention of Russian political, economical and academical elites. So it's that three problems to be solved. But anyway, anyway, what do we have for today? We have deep understanding of President Putin and some other political leaders that Moscow has no other choice than to develop the Far East and to choose fundamentally new model of this regional development. But the only chance to transform the region into the territory of progressive development is collaboration of all nations and peoples concerned in this development. 
Well, in my <coughs> paper, I suggested new model of Pacific Russia development. I will not talk about it because it will take more time, but I suppose uh, you, well, you understand this idea and support it. It is a hard job. It's a hard job because it takes time to support it, to develop it. It's only an idea. But the main thing, it's, it is impossible to develop the, all, the whole Far East and we should develop some special zones in this territory. Thank you for your attention.